Let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy, chapter 1. For whatever reason, my heading says 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Um, I uh, made a typo on the very heading of my own sermon. So if you hear me say 2 Timothy, chapter 2, we're actually in 2 Timothy, chapter 1. We're starting at the beginning of 2 Timothy, and we are committed to teaching and explaining the meaning of scriptures. Uh, just yesterday, I think it was, I was watching a, a TV show, and they had some things about uh, some crazy things that were happening at churches across America, and this great prognosticator came on and said, we must understand that the word of God was written over 2,000 years ago and it can't apply to today. It was written and you are to take it and be able to pull it apart and, and be able to apply it to what the meanings are today, not what they were 2,000 years ago. And I want you to know that nowhere in the Bible does it describe anything along those lines. The man and the world might change underneath the influence of Satan, but our God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is not changing. His laws do not change, and the New Testament doesn't change, and the things that are going to happen in the future are not going to change. Now, he might give us some more revelation when we hit uh, the, the Millennial Kingdom, and he might reveal some more things. I don't know what his plans are as far as that goes, but as far as today goes... What we need for life and living is all written down for us. We don't need anything extra. We don't need anything less. It, it doesn't have a different meaning today than it did 2,000 years ago. It still means the same thing today. And I'll tell you quite frankly, the problems they had 2,000 years ago are still the same problems we have today. They're just wrapped in a different package. It all starts from Satan. And, and in many cases, it, it, it involves the exact same sins just committed a different way today we have the internet and we have all kinds of access to all kinds of sexual sins over the internet well we're going to talk more about that actually tonight because our sermon tonight has to do with sexual sins but it's just a different way of addressing a same uh, an age old problem that they had all the way back 6,000 years ago, and 2,000 years ago, and today. And really, Satan's the leader of that all, isn't he? So Paul is writing this letter. It is written to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. Paul had been in Ephesus, and he left Timothy in charge of the church, and Paul is telling him to straighten it out. There's some problems. We recognize there's some problems. It's not a horrible church. It's not a bad church, but there's problems. And guess what? In every single church across America, there's problems, and there's things that we need to work out, and there's things that we need to do better, and there's things that underneath the power of the Holy Spirit we can correct and move forward. No church is perfect because of the human beings that are in it. <laughs> It's not God's fault. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ is our head, and we, we trust and, and we hope that we are hearing the uh, God, and we are putting our faith and trust in him, and we are following his lead. But because we're humans, we tend to muddle it up and goof some things up. It's not our desire. We have the ability not to goof it all up, but at times we do. And so Paul is writing. He's sitting in a dungeon. And by, and by the way, I, I found that picture that's on the front of your bulletin. You might be, why would Pastor Matt put that on the front of on front of the bulletin? That to me, I don't know if it's supposed to be Paul. I don't know who it's supposed to be. But it's a gentleman there, and he's penning a letter, isn't he? And, and Paul is penning this letter, and, and he's in jail. And I believe, based off of the writing here, Paul is experiencing some loneliness. You know, when Paul is writing some of his letters from jail, he says a couple of different times, you know, I'm here alone. Only Luke is here with me or only so-and-so is here with me. I am experiencing all these things and I'm going through great hardship and I don't have anybody to encourage me. 
And maybe at times there was Onesimus who might come and go and give him some encouragement, but really he was encouraging Onesimus, wasn't he? <laughs> he was sending Onesimus back. This has got to be some difficult times, some struggles. And I don't know if you can imagine the loneliness that Paul must have had. Now I know at most of the time he is chained to some kind of guard. And so there's some guy there that he can talk to and that he can try to witness to. And I can imagine if you were some kind of guard that had to be chained to Paul, you heard the gospel all day, all the time, and you probably got sick of him because you're not a believer. But Paul saw that as a mission opportunity. And I'm certain he preached to those guys. And he saw it as an opportunity to write these letters as he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So there is some joy that he's experiencing. And being filled with the Spirit, you would have joy. But at the same time, you're out there and you're working hard for God. You're doing what God has asked you to do. You go into work and you stand up for what is right. And your boss might ask you to do something that's wrong. And you say, as a believer, I'm not going to do that. As a Christian, that's not something I want to be involved with. I've had people to ask me to literally lie for them so they can get away with things. And I don't want to have anything to do with that. And it makes things hard, doesn't it? It's hard sometimes to stand up and do what's right. Especially if no one else around you seems like they're trying to do what's right. If there's no one around you to, to, to help lean upon and get some encouragement from and so Paul, I think, is lonely. He's in this dungeon. He sets out to write the last letter that he ever wrote. It's an important letter. He's concerned about the ministry. He's concerned that it'll keep going. And if you've ever been involved with a tremendous ministry wherever you're at or you have your own little ministry, I trust we all have our own little ministry. It can be our own family, passing our faith along to our family. It can be, you know, on a, on a smaller level in a church. And it could be that you were a pastor at one point in time or whatever is going on, whatever your roles are in the ministries. As you draw older and as you think that maybe you're coming near the end of your life, there should be a concern that the ministries that you were involved with would, would keep going on in God. That it won't be destroyed, that people won't come in the side doors and change things and make it worldly and, and start leaning upon Satan instead of God. Paul's concerned about it. And by the way, as Paul writes here, he's not concerned about his own worldly gain, is he? He's not concerned about himself. Paul has lost everything. I don't think he hardly has anything that he can call his own. And if you're about worldly gain, you need to look to someone like Paul who had no worldly gain. But I'm telling you, I'm certain when we get to heaven, he's going to have a tremendous spot there because he gave of himself in a tremendous way. He wants Timothy to be strong. He wants Timothy to keep going, even if it means being alone. Timothy, you teach what's right in that church, and if the whole congregation leaves, so be it. Do right. Give proper doctrine. Stand up to those who are trying to bring in false religions. So in chapter, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, we see that Paul is going to start Pleading, if you will. Matter of fact, if you go to chapter 4 real quick in verse number 1, you'll see Paul's concern. He says in chapter 4 and verse number 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He says, I charge thee. I'm concerned that things are beginning to slip. He's saying, be strong. So he's going to give some encouragement to his spiritual son here. First thing he's going to do is lay up his authority. Paul, in order to encourage people throughout the Bible, Paul does this. He sets up his authority in case there's any question. And this isn't Paul being braggadocious. This isn't Paul being filled with himself. This isn't Paul saying, I'm awesome, you stink. 
which is how some people describe Paul, by the way. I heard one gentleman one time on a TV show I was watching declared Paul an, uh, uh, an epileptic, and he had seizures. And people that have seizures do the type of things that Paul does, and that is tell everybody else they're wrong. You're wrong, I'm right, do it my way. When you write underneath the power of the Holy Spirit, you write underneath the power of God, it's God saying those things, right? Here is God describing what you need to do. Instead, if you don't see Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit, you see him being some kind of dictator telling everybody what to do. So he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. How did Paul become an apostle? By the will of God. And by the way, Paul was an apostle with a special calling. His calling was different than the other apostles' of calling. The other apostles were called differently than Paul. Directly by Christ, the other guys, right, when Christ was here on this earth. He selected the disciples, they became apostles. Paul's was a little different. <laughs> God knocked him down when he was walking on a road. And God called him then. And guess what? Paul's calling is to the Gentiles particularly. As he went out, sure, he would witness to a Jew. He would tell a Jew. He would go to the synagogues and speak to the Jews first. But really, who became believers underneath Paul's ministry? The Gentiles did. They're the ones that were accepting. So Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. I have authority here. It's not my authority. It's God's authority working through me. And by the way, if you feel like I have any authority in this church, the authority is not me physically, right? If there's any authority, it's God working through me. And so if I'm going to lead, it needs to be God as the head, Christ as the head. And as the leadership in the church moves forward, it has to be nothing more than the will of God, not my will. There's things in my flesh I would want to do different. But by the will of God, we move forward. And we present his will, not our own. So that is exactly what Paul is saying. I am sent by God. His will. And then he says, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. I have life, I have life eternal, and it only comes through Christ Jesus. He's the authority by the will of God. So Timothy, here's the authority. And I'll tell you, as I, I grew up, my, my father was an authority figure in my life, both physically and spiritually. When I was a teenager, it was probably more physically than spiritually. <laughs> my, uh, my spiritual manner was probably not the greatest at that point in time. And so there was some physical enforcement of um, his authority. But as I became a young man and, and entered into the ministry and I followed God's leading and God's directing, my dad became a great spiritual authority to me. I could ask him all kinds of questions. What do you know about this? What do you know about that? How would you handle this situation? How do you think God would want me to handle this situation? I got a difficult situation in my church. What do you think I should do? And that's exactly what Paul is trying to do to Timothy. Let me show you what God would have you to do. So I'm going to set up my authority. And that's a great motivation for a young guy or anybody in a church. To know that the person that's leading is leading underneath the authority of God and that they have your best interest in mind and not their best interest in mind. You will know when I'm trying to force my will upon you. And you will know when it's God leading and directing. It becomes very apparent. Second thing that Paul does is he commands I remember when my dad would tell me to do something. 
as a teenager, and I know sometimes people, when they turn into teenagers, they think, okay, my dad's 45, I can take him. <laughs> so let's go. I, I never had that thought. My dad had four black belts and was a karate instructor. Never once in my mind, even when he was 70, did I think I could take my dad. I'm sure at 70 and me 50 or 45, he would still take me. I never wanted to get into a fight with him. So I, I never got into that situation with him. So whenever my dad, especially as a teenager, would tell me to do something or a young kid to do something, he had already said his authority. I think I told you guys twice in my life, my dad spanked me for an hour straight. Now that sounds like a child abuse, doesn't it? I'm going to take him to court now. It's the greatest thing that ever happened in my life, by the way. One time, it was to shut the basement door. And I told him no. I, I don't even remember it, so I must have been five or six, somewhere in that age range. So he spanked me and told me to shut the door, and I said no, and he spanked me and said shut the door, and I said no, and he spanked me and he said shut the door, and I said no, that's how, that's how stubborn I am. Leo attests that I'm a pretty stubborn guy. And my dad beat a lot of that out of me, and I say beat, it was a loving punishment that I received. The other time was because I wouldn't pick up the toys, and I said I didn't get them out. He said I didn't ask you if you got them out, I said put them away, and I said no, so he spanked me. And my mom had to leave the house because my mom was going to clean up the toys instead of me. He needed to do that so that I would understand authority. Realize I'm not going to be the boss ever of my life. Because <laughs> when you get out of the house, you're still not boss of your life, are you? I love my dad for doing that. He cared enough to do that. And Paul is laying up authority to Timothy. He is saying, God is working through me. God is in me. And once I lay up the authority, then I can start to do some things. And one is to command. It's through the power of God. It's not my own will. It's not my own way. This is what God would have you to do. Listen up. This is strong motivation. And I want you to know that when Paul gives these commands, it's not because I'm stronger than you. It's not abuse. It's not um, some kind of punishment that's out of line. Because what does Paul say to Timothy in verse number two? He says, to Timothy, my dearly beloved, I love you. I want you to know, I know my dad punished, if you will, out of love and concern for me. I didn't know it then. I'm sure I thought I was being raised by Hitler. <laughs> but he loved and he cared. And there was some punishment that went along with it. And Paul tells Timothy, you're my Beloved son, I love you like a son. Spiritually, you are my son. I led you to the Lord. If you love someone, you should desire for them to have grace, mercy, and peace. That is what I want in your life. I desire that in your life. And so there's times that we go through hardships and struggles for us to grasp and understand grace, mercy, and peace. It doesn't happen when we're rebellious. It happens when we fall underneath the authority of God and his will. Because look at who it comes from. It's from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. This is tender. <coughs> and if you want to motivate someone, let them know that you desire for them to have what's best. Mm 
Let them know that you desire for them to have spiritual blessedness. And when they see that in you and they know that that's in you and they know that it's the power of God working through you, that'll motivate them. It should motivate them if they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse number three because we really start getting personal then. He says, I thank God. Notice, he doesn't thank Timothy. <laughs> you would think that Paul would say, Timothy, I'm so thankful for you. Nowhere in here does it say that. <laughs> he says, I'm the authority. I desire what's best for you. And I thank God for you. Why? Who made Timothy? God made Timothy. Who sanctified Timothy? God sanctified Timothy. Who made Timothy whole? God made Timothy whole. The Holy Spirit did a tremendous work in Timothy. It's all God's work. It's none of Paul's work. Even though Timothy is Paul's son spiritually, God's the one that did all the work, not Paul. Paul was simply used of God and used of the Holy Spirit to accomplish a tremendous miracle. Anytime someone comes to know the Lord as their personal Savior, it's a tremendous miracle. And it's solely the work of God. You're being used of them. You're being used of the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, I thank God whom I serve from my fathers with a pure conscience. Now that's an interesting statement. The God whom I serve, and why does he say this? He says it with a, with, he says the, the, the last words there is with a pure conscience. Well, evidently, and I'm sure it's true, uh, people hated Paul. Paul would go into town, he'd go into the synagogues, he would stand up and tell people what the Holy Spirit's telling him. He would stand up and talk with the other leaders in the synagogue, and they would have discussions. And guess what? Paul knew the Old Testament, and the New Testament was being revealed to him. And he could take the Old Testament because of his upbringing and everything else, and he was highly intelligent in those things. He had the greatest of teachers. He could debate those guys and make them look foolish. I have no doubts about it. I'm sure his desire wasn't to make them look foolish, but they hated it because he had all the answers. That was the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. So they, they, they came to hate him. As a matter of fact, we, we find um, what in Berea, they ran him right out of town, right? No, it wasn't Berea. Thessalonica, wherever it was. They hated him. And then they went to the next town and ran him out of that town too. So they hated him. Now he's in jail. What do you think people would say? See, he's gotten what's coming to him. Paul's got a sin in his life and God is punishing him. People undoubtedly were saying those things about him. So what does Paul say? Listen, I serve from my forefathers. Now, I don't know who the forefathers are there. Who are the forefathers? He might be talking about the Old Testament saints, Moses, Abraham, all those guys. He might be talking about the people he served with in the New Testament, uh, Peter, James, and John, and those guys. It might be all of them. I don't know. They don't really tell us there. But he says, I'm serving from my forefathers with a pure conscience. I know God has me in jail for a reason, and it's God doing it, not some sin I'm involved with. That word serve, by the way, there where he says, I serve from my forefathers. That word means I started serving and I never ended. I continually serve. I'm serving, serving, serving. I am serving God. You could translate that word into worship. I worship God always. I'm not stopping. And then he says that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So here's another motivation. And it's appeal. Paul is telling Timothy something. And he's, he uses some redundancy here to prove a point or, or to push a point. 
He says, without ceasing. Well, that means always, right? And then at the end, he says, night and day. Well, what does that mean? If I do something night and day, what does it mean? Always. And if I do something without ceasing, that means always. He is emphasizing that I, whenever I get down on my knees to pray, whenever I'm in prayer with God, which hopefully I'm in sweet communion with God most of the time, if not all the time, I am constantly reminded of you and I'm constantly praying for you. You want to encourage someone in the Lord? Pray for them. Let them know you're praying for them. Keep praying for them. I am praying for you over and over again. We have bulletins, and our bulletins are prayer lists. Pray for those people. And don't just pray for their physical needs. That's an easy thing to do, right? I think of someone, they've got some kind of physical need. I'm going to pray for that physical need. Pray for their spiritual needs, too. Pray that they'll grow in the Lord. Some people say, Pastor Matt, I, you know, I get down and pray, and I, and I get through all my prayer requests in like three minutes. What do I pray for then? <laughs> As you start praying... And as you're thinking about that person on the prayer list, don't just pray about their physical needs. Pray for them spiritually. Pray that they'll grow in the Lord. Pray that they'll follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul is doing for Timothy. He remembers him continually. That word prayer, by the way, in, in, in the Greek means petition or Pleading, I am pleading with God for you that you'll be strong, you'll do the right thing, you'll follow the things I'm going to outline here in the first letter I wrote you and now in this letter that I'm writing you. Then in verse number four, how else are you going to encourage someone? Give some affirmation. Greatly desiring to see thee. Oh, that's interesting. Remember I told you at the beginning that Paul says he's kind of lonely? And I think we see that right here. Or I said Paul was kind of lonely. I think he is. Because he writes here and he says, I, I, I want to see you. I wish I could see you. I don't think he did after he wrote this letter. I desire to see you. I want to be with you. I want to have sweet communion with you. Sometimes we just can't have that, can we? We love it when our missionaries come by the Browns. We get to have sweet communion with them. We get to get caught up with what they're doing. We get to talk with them and see them. And that's wonderful. But you know what? Most of the time they're in Indonesia. It's really hard for us to get over there, isn't it? It's really hard for us to be in their presence. You know what? Sometimes we have friends and family that we would love to be around and love to see all the time. But they're just they're, they're serving God somewhere else, and we can't do that. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Listen, I want to see you. And what was he? He was being mindful of thy tears. The last time Paul and Timothy were together, their communion must have been so wonderful that it brought them to tears. As they prayed over people and as they talked over things that were going on and as they encouraged each other, it literally brought them to tears probably when they separated. Because they love each other to such a degree. But Timothy has a ministry somewhere. And Paul has something to do himself. So I want to be with you. I am mindful of thy tears. That I may be filled with joy. It would give me great joy. To be in your presence. Then in verse number five. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith. So Paul is reminded of something. When I call to remembrance. And what is it? It's his faith. And this is interesting because he says, you have a faith that is in you. And it's a tremendous faith. I know it's a tremendous faith. You know where I saw that faith at? I saw that faith in your grandmother. And his grandmother is Lois. And I saw that faith in your mom. And his mom's name is Eunice. You have that same faith. It's strong. And as we see uh, through scripture, 
I think in uh, chapter 3 and verse number 15, if you, if you look at chapter 3 and verse number 15 of 2 Timothy there, look at what it says. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So he says, listen, since the time you were a little kid, you were taught how to be a believer, what that's like. You know where he got it from? Not his dad, not his grandpa. From his grandma and from his mom. We had Mother's Day. Was that last week? Oh, that seems like a long time ago. And what a wonderful thing to encourage someone in, right? Grandma and mom passed along faith to Timothy, who's a tremendous man of faith now. You know what? I'm a fourth generation pastor, which doesn't happen very often. And now Josh is a fifth generation pastor. But that's even weirder, right? I mean, that, that's really hard to imagine that that could happen. Um, doesn't happen very often. That's a strong faith that's been passed down from my from my great grandfather who became a believer and planted churches all over Grand Rapids and did all kinds of things. But it took individuals and people to love God and honor God and serve God and keep passing that faith along. And Paul is saying, listen, Timothy, I know you have a strong faith. It's there. It came from Eunice. It came from Lois. You got it. Pass it along. Pass it along to the church. Keep passing the faith along. And I want you to know it doesn't make a difference if you're a first-generation Christian or if you're a fifth-generation Christian. If you have the faith of God, it's a strong faith. You need to submit to it. Allow God to work in your life. Allow, allow God to work in you. And pass that on to the next generation. They need it desperately. Our world desperately needs God. Our world desperately needs the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what God is doing in America. I don't know what God is doing across seas. But we need to pass that faith along. And that's what Paul is saying about Timothy. You have it, keep it, and pass it. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this message you gave to us today as we start off in 2 Timothy. Father, I pray that we can be motivated we see some of the motivational things that Paul uses on Timothy. I pray that just simply as we think about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, that we are the temple of, of the living God. I pray that we can go out, fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit, that our faith would be evident, that people would see it. And as we have that strong faith that we will understand the grace and mercy and peace that comes through that. And Father, as we then live out your words and your ways uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that others will see that, that our families will see it, that we can pass along that faith to them. And Fathers, that others in the world would see the same thing, be drawn to it, and that we can be good witnesses for you in this lost and dying world. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have a closing song. It's number four.